Welcome, everybody. It's the uh, Hot Air Podcast. My name is Matt Kundal. The Hot Air Podcast is is really just me. When I get like interested in something, I just can't stop thinking about it. So today, we're going to be talking about wine. And I just couldn't possibly sit here and talk wine with you for a half hour or an hour or whatever. So uh, this is why we bring on experts for this stuff. So today, I'd like to bring on Dora Lobo. Hello, Hello. Dora. How are you? Very well. How are you? Good. Uh, so quick background into, into how I connected with, with Dora. And it was really uh, through the wonders of Facebook. And, and Kathy Heller has a Facebook group. Yeah. Um, and she's got a great podcast as well. And I, I met Kathy a number of years ago. And she's incredibly encouraging and sort of, I'd already struck out on my own, but she really, you know, sort of forced me to, to, to put my nose to the grindstone and, and get out there and, and do it. And, and there you were in, in her uh, in her Facebook group and, and talking about wine and talking about some of the people who were ta- on your Instagram page and, you know, <laughs> and who are kind of making fun of you going, wait, what are you? Some sort of wine influencer. I go, oh. <laughs> it's true. It is very true. It happens, right? Because when I decided that I wanted to uh, teach wine, do some courses and uh, people were a little bit weirded out because they thought, well, Dora is my friend who is a sommelier. But why is she talking about wine in her Instagram instead of just showing her life? Um, I just decided to turn my personal Instagram into something that would be more interesting for everybody who would like to follow me and talk about wine and about cocktails. So this this little change kind of freaked some people out. They thought, why are you doing this? But I think that people understand it now and they not uh, ask me those questions anymore. Yeah, I thought the best was, what are you, some sort of wine influencer? I know, it's influencer is a bad word, right, nowadays. So if you say you're a wine influencer, it's like the worst, the worst thing to say about somebody. So um, I still want to be a respected sommelier, but I did want to talk about wine. And I like to entertain people. So I did want to talk about wine in a kind of a light, humorous, fun way. Um, so that's what I tried to do in my Instagram. No, no, no. I, I think you should be a wine influencer. You should put it right on your business. <laughs> on the bio. <laughs> yeah. Want to be wine influencer. <laughs> and so I'm, I've been fascinated by wine for, for so many years because, uh, you know, I, li- I like food and then the wine gets paired with it. And then, oh, why is some of it more expensive than the other stuff? So uh, right. how did you get into wine? Uh, it's a long story. I was I grew up in Brazil, and uh, up until 2006, I was living there. Um, I had graduated in law. I passed the bar test, actually, and I became a lawyer, and I really hated it. That was not for me. I just wanted to complete the whole thing, you know, get my bachelor's degree and, and get into the bar, and I just got out of Brazil and went to London to live in London. So I moved to England in 2006. And I decided what I'm going to do. Everybody who moves to London, to England, they say, I'm going to work in a pub. And that's what I did. Uh, But then I decided, well, I don't want to just work in a pub. I wanted to have some sort of specialist uh, knowledge. So I decided to study wines. I think that just before I moved to London, also my father passed away very suddenly. And that was the kind of thing that you think, you know, I'm going to do what I want to do because life is short. Um, so I had that insight and decided I'm not going to work with something that I'm not passionate about. And I was passionate about wine always. Um, so I decided to just pivot and uh, decide to leave my law degree and start studying wines from that. Is it just me or, or people in Britain drunk a lot? Like when you're oh, in. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, my God. It's the hobby there. It's just the pastime, the favorite pastime. It is. Yeah. We go to when I was working. Uh, get out of work. Even if I wasn't working in hospitality, I would be working e-commerce, for example, with wines and then get out of there. Everybody be, we go to the pub and it's about four, five, six pints of beer later. And, you know, and then they try to go home. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It, it's, it's a culture there for sure. So what is it about wine that, that made you want to become a sommelier? Um, I think that wine is uh, not just a food enhancer, it's a life enhancer. I always love wines, I always celebrated with wines. I'd go uh, with my family to restaurants and the first thing we would do is like pick a bottle of wine or pick 
a glass of something, let's experiment and let's celebrate life. So I always thought of it as a positive thing and, uh, and something that would always complement my dishes. Um, so I always loved it. I can't really explain why, but the more I learned about wines, the more I was interested in them. So I just kept learning and learning until, you know, I was in this hospitality and retail and e-commerce industry, but always uh, working with wines. And we were just talking a little bit about, about, you know, Kathy Heller and, and her big podcast is called Don't Keep Your Day Job. <laughs> yeah. And, and so you've obviously gotten rid of what was a day job at one point, which was, uh, you know, being a lawyer. Um, yeah. You still have a day job now and, and, and you've changed your passion and here you are and, and you're doing food and beverage and, and, and also wine. So tell me a little bit about your work day and, and, and your job that you're doing in food and beverage. Yeah, I love that podcast because it's full of inspiring stories and uh, I don't want to be in hospitality forever. I did think when the pandemic hit, I thought mm, my restaurant had to close and I was like, what else can I do with wines? What do I love? So I started questioning these things and in case the restaurant wasn't back anytime soon. Um, so I thought, you know what? I am actually gonna teach wine uh, online and I love doing it. And that's something that I do apart from my job, but my job is very diverse, you know. It's actually a vegan fine dining restaurant and I'm vegetarian uh, in Washington, DC. And I pair the wines there and I also, create the cocktails so there's a lot to do because they also have events there so there's just a lot of uh different things that i do on a day-to-day -day basis which is really interesting i'm never really that bored yeah so I, I just put up on our screen in the middle here it was kathy heller's podcast yeah. don't keep your day job and that's a great podcast i really love it I, you know, she she's fantastic. And when I sat to go and listen to her talk at Podcast Movement in, I think it was 2017, uh, you know, very inspirational person who who just, uh, you know, said, you got to, you you can do it. It can be done. Because a lot of us do get trapped. And, and I got trapped for many years doing something that was was okay. But, I, you know, I was a little bit too married to it. And I, I managed to separate it uh, from myself and, and then break out to do, you know, what it is that, that, that we're doing now, which is, um, you know, for you, it's, it's, talking about wine uh, all day. And, and of course you, you mix drinks and I, I do want to bring you back at some point. So I, I mean, we're only like a few minutes in on this show, but I'm already scheduling the next show for when we actually mix drinks. But I know you're like an old fashioned, so I will teach you that one. Again, I, I couldn't possibly do it on my own. I, <laughs> I can't figure it out for the life of me. And I'm just I'm it's kind the of easiest cocktail, the easiest. I mean, I watch Bar Rescue from time to time, and they make it seem so easy. But I know there's a whole lot more to it. <laughs> there is not. We're gonna just end your fear of making cocktails because it's really fun. It's really easy too. Okay, so when but when it comes to to wine pairing, mm -hmm. um, what what is, is there? I mean, we want to say okay, so white wine with the fish and red wine with the, with the red meat, right? And, and you know, certain grapes for certain types of meat. I mean. I, you know, there are times when I do go to a restaurant and I say, send me the sommelier. Yeah, you should. They yeah. Take advantage of that, for sure. That's what they're there for. Um, but there are some principles about pairing wine with food. You have you have, or you do not have to follow them. Um, it's really up to you. It's whatever you like uh, with what you are having. But I would say this. Um, you want to match intensity of the food with the intensity of the wine. That's the most important thing. So if you're having, for example, the fish, you don't want to have a very big red with the fish because then you wouldn't be able to taste the fish. That's why we, we want is not to overpower the food and not to overpower the wine. So we want to match the intensity, which is, for example, I have a nice spicy curry. So I'm going to pair with a red wine, which has a little bit of spiciness to it. The grape has a natural spice like Syrah or Shiraz, which is the same grape, or Tempranillo from Spain. So you can do that. But if you think, for example, that the curry is too spicy, you might want to pair with a sweeter wine. And that's another principle of uh, pairing food and wine is just counterbalance that. If you have something that you want to minimize in the food, you can apply, you know, something that's opposite to it in the wine. Uh, and then they'll complement each other. For example, I had this beet uh, dish that I had at the restaurant this weekend, and that's why I brought this wine because I went the beet because I had a little bit of bitterness toward the beet. So I thought a sweeter wine 
which is enough dry wine, really, it's not a sweet wine, uh, would be better. And I thought this was a really good pairing and it's a really delicious and inexpensive wine that anybody can, can buy. So you, you sort of flash back here for me because I remember my gateway wine into pairing mm -hmm. was curry. I love curry. Yeah. But the owner of the restaurant, and I'll even mention the right, it was the New Asian Village in Edmonton, Alberta. The owner was Harmeet Kapoor, and he loved a great glass of scotch. Yeah. But he would, you know, when I would order wine, he would always suggest a, uh, a Shiraz. And yeah. so it was spice and spice, and it paired <laughs> wonderfully. Yeah, I mean, some people love it. They, they want to pair spice with spice, but people who do not like spiciness that much, they might not really be that keen on having a Shiraz or a Pimponio. It really depends on your taste. So that's very subjective in that way, pairing wine with food. It's really what you like and what you intend to do with it. Um, there are definitely times that I think this is too spicy. Uh, so I'm going to go with the Riesling, which is what you have today. Do you have a Riesling? You said that you had the German wine. I, I have a German wine with me right now. Okay. Uh, but I wanted to go with the grape you were talking about, which was going to be a Pinot Blanc, I think. Yes. I was talking about Pinot Blanc, but this is actually Chenin Blanc. So ah. this is Chenin Blanc. Uh, Chenin Blanc, which is written C-H-E-N-I-N, -N, Chenin Blanc, like white, is a grape that's super versatile. It, you can make sparkling wine with it. You can make still wine. You can make dessert wine with it. So it's a really wonderful grape that makes wonderful different wines. Um, the grape that I was, sorry, the region that I was actually drinking today is the Vouvray, which is in the Loire Valley in France, which is the home of Chenin Blanc. And Loire Valley just makes the most wonderful white wines. I fell in love with the Loire Valley in 2006 when I was learning about wines and still uh, I would say this is my favorite white wine. This Bordeaux whites and Loire Valley whites are my favorite for sure. Excellent. And I'm a lover of French wine and I'm going to go spend more time drinking some of those whites. I, I, I know it, you know, your job, sommelier, food and beverage manager, I'm going to call you in here to be a bit of a relationship manager here, okay. because, uh, you know, go to dinner. So we want to have fish and uh -huh. it's like, Oh, she likes white. I like red, but we're having a fish dish. Yeah. How are you going to steer us through this relationship problem? Yeah, that happens quite a lot, actually. People, oh, I want a white, I want a red. There is no rules about saying, oh, no, you cannot have red with fish. You can't have red with fish, but it needs to be a lighter red for, for sure because you don't want a big, bold red with your fish or you wouldn't be able to taste the fish at all. But you can go to a gamay or a Pinot Noir, lighter grapes made in a, usually in the old world, that is Europe, um, would go very well with fish. And you can also go for something in the middle, like a rosé, if you don't like white or red. Or you can have an orange wine <laughs> if you don't want to decide between white or red. So it is a world of possibilities. There are also white wines that are a little bit more on the full-bodied side that have been aged in oak that could be interesting with fish. And even people who like red wine could be open to trying this wine as well. Yeah, if I'm going to get a red wine and there's some fish, I don't think I could. I, I want to keep it light, so I'd want to go for a Pinot Noir. Is there anything else other than that? Um, yeah, there are a few. Gamay is the other one that I said, uh, which is a grape they usually have in the Beaujolais region. Uh, in other places, I had a Gamay from Serbia <laughs> the other day that was really delicious. Uh, Pinot Noir from Germany is also really great. Which we we're talking about German wines, and they, they make really good Pinot Noirs. Um, you can also have a Docetto from Italy that tends to be on the lighter side as well. So there are grapes that are usually very light in, in style and they usually don't age them um, in the barrels, in note barrels for a long time. So they will be clean enough for you to have the fish and taste all the flavors of the fish. So here's a question. So like Spanish wine, we got Italian wines, we got French wines. Uh, and then there's no German section on any of, you know, no. in any, I go, no, yeah, no. here. I, but not often that you see, you know, what is it about German wines that <laughs> people have not latched on to for many years? Yes, because this is the thing about Germany. It's very cool climate, right? We all know that. Uh, so they make really wonderful whites um, and they don't make a lot of wonderful reds because it's very hard to make a big red in a cold climate like in Germany. So people would definitely forget, not even think about Germany about for reds, even though they make some really good reds, like I said, the Pinot Noir, or they call it Spatburgunder, 
but it's the same grape as the Pinot Noir. But people also think that Germans only make Riesling, you know, they make a lot of, you know, Pinot Gris, Silvana, Mule Thorgau, other really interesting grapes. And they associate Riesling with sweet wine, which is not true because they make also a lot of dry wine. So I think that people don't know German wines very well. And it's hard. German wines has a lot of details and, and a lot of things about Germany that's very hard to understand. It starts with the language that's very hard to pronounce. And I think people are a little bit hesitant to to go for the German wine section if you have one. I do have one here. You know, and when you read it, it's 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 Weiss Burgunder from the Rhine Valley. Burgunda. Yeah, Weiss Burgunder is Pinot, Pinot Blanc. Yeah. It's the same same grape. Right. But but this isn't the most marketable word in the world. No, it's not. Can you imagine just put Weiss Burgunder and nobody knows what it is. We're like, okay. how are you gonna buy that? <laughs> Actually, more importantly, what's it going to taste like here? Oh, it's going to be great, I'm sure. I don't know that one that you bought, but I really love Pinot, Pinot Blanc or Weiss Burgunder. Right. Uh, and I think that German and Alsace, which is a region in France that's been passed, you know, during the wars between Germany and, and France, um, also makes it really great Pinot Blanc or Weiss Burgunder. Or Pinot, you know... Bianco in Italy, they have many, many different names for the grapes. Mm. Why? What do you think? I think it's very good. I enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> it's um, it comes off. It goes in. I, I want to say it's going to be sweet, and it's not sweet at all, and it's not dry at all. Uh, so this comes out of the Rhineland, and so this is not your traditional German wine, right? Uh, and this, you know, this winery is from what I was told today when I was. You know, when I went to make this purchase, you know, they were on again, off again, but they are the darlings of of the Rhineland region when it comes to to making wine, and uh, they pushed all in, and this is this is quite a nice, enjoyable taste. So, thanks for pushing me in this direction. <laughs> no, that's great, and I'm glad that they they give some you know some tips on how to buy a German wine because there are lots of times I went to you go to a wine shop and you have no idea what to do. It's like, oh, I'm gonna look for wine or. How do I know if this tastes good? So if you have somebody there guiding you, it's perfect. It's what you need. Help me out through France, because France is, by the way, a, a bit of a wine snob. So, you know, I love Italian. I understand Italian wine. I know what to do with my Chianti. I know what to do with the rest of the Tuscan stuff. I know what meat goes. I, I just know it. Right. Spain, I know some of it. I know Rioja. And then there's Tempranillo, but I can't seem to warm up to Spanish wines. And this is after spending time in Legrono. Oh, dare now, you. Well, when I mean warm up to it, I mean, come away with a favorite. Okay, got it. So, you know, I try to put, you know, a Rioja on the table. Um, I don't get universal. Yeah, this is great. You know, mm. you know, people seem to be sort of more all in or all out with, with each one of these types of wines. But when it comes to French wines, I've got no problem. Right. So, so this leaves the debate down to this. Okay. Um, all right. By the way, Spanish wines are uh, very divisive in a way that Rioja can be really bad as well because you got the Rioja Crianzas that can be really, they're not matured enough. Um, so they're very alcoholic and they don't, don't actually have any complexity to it. But if you have a Grand Reserve, uh, a nice aged Rioja, you're gonna see the difference. It's just like a completely different world. That's the thing about Spanish wines. And from the Valdepeñas region, which is close to Rioja, which is also the same grape as Rioja, which is Tempranillo is the main grape, and they also use Garnacha. Um, but uh, there are very different regions that people, they don't know in Spain because Spain was kind of like forgotten for a long time. And then after the EU or the European Union, they injected some money to Spain. They learned about uh, making wines with the French and now they're making wonderful wines. So you should give Spain another try. Oh, I'll, I'll go back to Spain, you know, in a, in a heartbeat, but I find it's very regional, right? So if you, if you spend time up in, uh, up in the Basque country, you know, sometimes it's wine, but you know, we're on to Ticoli and cider. And then we go south into Legrono and it's all Rioja. And then you have to pick your Rioja you know, and they'll order by, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Crianza. Uh, you'll order a little bit closer to to the type. They don't really spend a lot of time with the region. 
right. that much. So, um, and also when, when I travel to Europe, I find that uh, you're getting the local stuff, but you know, it's the table wine, right? It's, it's yeah, exactly, yeah, you know, and, you gotta and, know what to look for. And, you know, again, if you have somebody who knows about wine there, yeah, you don't want to go for the, for the cheapest of the table wine ever, because they're going to give you plonk for sure. I love that word. Oh. <laughs> because <laughs> <it's> <laughs> vinaigre, <you> know. <laughs> so, which is great. Cause that brings us to France. Um, and so I've got, how did I pull? I didn't mean to pull this bottle out, but anyway. Oh, I, I, France is my favorite. So I'm always, always look, I love French wine. Since I studied wines in England. Uh, they're definitely suckers for French wine over there. Uh, and so most of my education in England was European wine. So I do love a French wine. So what is uh, Chateau Neuf de Pape? Oh, that's my favorite. <laughs> that's a coincidence. Well, it's my favorite too. I love it. I love it. So this is from the Rhone Valley, from the Southern Rhone Valley. And Chateau Neuf de Pape is a region inside the Rhone Valley, of course. They make really robust and beautiful reds. Uh, they can make whites as well. Uh, but they what they make best is reds. They also have Chateau Neuf de Pape Blanc. Chateau Neuf de Pape Red has Syrah as the main grape, but they have about 13 grapes, up to 13 grapes inside of Chateau Neuf de Pape. Some only have like three, four, or five, but they can have up to 13. So it makes a lot of complexity. There's a lot of complexity in Chateau Neuf de Pape. I just love how the tannins are smooth if it's a well-made Chateau Neuf de Pape, and it's got a little bit of spiciness, and it's got a little bit of everything. It's definitely my favorite wine in the whole world. So, and here's one that's that's a relationship saver for me, and and that's a uh, this is a Bourgogne, uh, with a okay. Pinot Noir with a Pinot Noir grape in it. And I look at the, yeah. all right, okay, a Bourgogne, okay, okay. So th this this for me is is a, you know w when, you know when we go out for dinner we're saying Pinot Noir, mm -hmm. um, and when I when I say we I mean I mean Avery, who who I've you know been with for right. me, and we travel, okay. Um, but you know, these this is sort of where we settled in France on many of these wines, and and this is a question I want to ask about about you know headaches. So she she says, that, oh, I'm off red, I get a headache. It's only reds that give her a headache. Um, it, it could be it could be some some bad whites too. But you know, when when we say okay, we're ordering red, I can see her face. She goes, ah, I might be getting a headache. well. There's there are a few things here to be considered because red wine can have more alcohol and if you're drinking a lot of it and you're not drinking water you're not rehydrating yourself and you're just you know drinking reds and you're not eating something with it it can be terrible the next day you know you just have to think about having water and having some food while you're having your red but it also could be that she has some sort of allergy to histamine maybe, which is in the in the red wine, or it could be sulfates. I mean, it could be anything that she has allergy to. But my guess is most people, they say that because it's the alcohol content of the wine uh, that could be higher in red. And also the tannins are really strong. So you feel that as well. And, and so next day, if you're not drinking water and eating something, you're definitely gonna feel it because you have this um, Vouvray here that I'm drinking, it's only 12% alcohol. And you can have, I don't know your German wine, what's the percentage, percentage that you have there, but you can have reds that are up to 16% and that's really strong. That's 12 and a half percent on this bottle that I'm drinking right now. Right, so they tend to be lower in alcohol. That's of course, it goes, California has usually, um, bigger wines, uh, Chardonnays that can be 14%, but usually uh, white wines have lower in alcohol and they're easier. It's just, um, sometimes you, you tend to drink red more too. So it, it really depends uh, what, I'm not sure if her case is that she's drinking without um, drinking water or that she just has an allergy. It could be that too. Yeah, or it could be, I'm, I'm a lousy picker. <laughs> you know, spine cheap plonk, that's what you get. <laughs> so, so where do you draw the line at what is cheap plonk and what is a good bottle of wine? So if you're going to the store, uh -huh. uh, where is, where's the price point on plonk versus wine? <laughs> I don't, I don't have a price point. I'm going to be very honest because this Vouvray, uh, that I'm drinking right now is actually cheap. I'm not sure how it retails, but we bought it wholesale and I was just, just over $10. So it's really cheap. Um, 
So, and it's a really good wine, it's delicious. And what I usually try to look for is the region of AOC, which is the control of quality in the wine. For France is AOC, for it, Spain is DOC, for Italy is also DOC. So it is quality control that the government gives to the wine. It will assess um, the vineyards, the winemaking process and say, this is good. You can use this name as a quality control. And uh, I would definitely use those things in order to find a wine that I think this is going to be good. This is a guarantee. You know, sometimes I also buy wine that I think could be great. And I'm disappointed when I get home and open, oops, this was not good at all because yeah, I got to try. I got to try everything to make sure that, you know, because there are some very small villages that make wine, but they don't have the quality control because they're just so tiny. So you got to try them as well and see if they are maybe, you know, really good. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. So do you get into, like, let's say an app like Vivino uh, and <laughs> you go in and take a look at that? Or do you find like most of that is just pedestrian sort of reviews and not reliable? I mean, yeah. is there any use to it to wine apps? I hate, I hate wine apps. <laughs> Just so I don't sort of use them. I don't like them because, yeah, it's just anybody. It's like Yelp, you know, like people think they're food critics on Yelp and they're going to say, oh, this is terrible. And it's actually not. So I don't I don't read Yelp either. I um, go like to make my own choices. Of course, I like, you know, the economy of trust that we are in, that everybody leaves a review. But there's a lot of people who have no idea about wine or food for that matter. And they were going to say that this wine is terrible and I'm not going to believe in them. I'm definitely going to make up my own mind. So no, I don't, I don't use apps at all. That's me over there. Yeah, well, <laughs> this is what we're doing here. We're going with the old share screen again. Because, uh, <laughs> so, and by the way, for anybody who, who is watching this, whether it's live or on, on the replay, uh, give Dora a follow. Uh, very, very simple Dora Lobo on Instagram. Uh, this is where you're making your hay. Um, what you'll do when you go on to Dora's Instagram page is you'll find a lot about wine, but you'll also find some very upset friends of hers who can't believe that she's turned into a wine influencer. Um, uh, oh, they don't say anything anymore. I'll delete uh, the comments if they say something. <laughs> uh, no, but I, I, did I did find that amusing because I find that the, the brand that you're doing here by, by you know doing the wine stuff, and I found this particular post Fascinating, right. um, absolutely fascinating, and that's you know the the gold band that goes around a Spanish bottle here, and and why they did that. Yeah. So why why is that? Well, they are just trying to protect the wines. That well, this was in eighteen hundreds, and Marquis de Riscal was the favorite producer for the King of Spain back then, and the King of Spain. Uh, of course, he loved it. He just kept buying and everybody heard about it. He was kind of the celebrity at the time, of course, like, uh, you know, the Kardashians. <laughs> it would be the marketing that the king um, gave Marquette de Riscal was uh, so great that everybody was trying to buy it. Well, if the king wants it, if the king loves it, I should get some. So what they're doing, because there is no foil back then, right, to protect the top of the wine. They're just taking out um, the cork and they're just replacing the wine with fake wine, a lesser known, lesser known a, bad, a bad quality wine most of the times, and then reselling at that time. So they came up with this gold wire to protect the reputation of the wines, you know? So I bet it was a better gold wire than they have right now, because this gold wire they have right now is super easy to just get rid of. Uh, but apparently that wasn't the case back then. So he invested heavily, you know, made his wines um, super luxury in, in just the gold wire, of course, was expensive as well, but people wanted to have that. It's a kind of branding, you know, that was genius back then. It's just, wow, I, have, I need to have this gold wire uh, bottle. It made it even more inviting and more, you know, uh, sought after. So I thought it was genius what they did. So there's a degree of, uh, I don't want to say snobbery, but I think, uh, you know, elitism that comes with wine. And, and for years, and I think we've gotten past this, but it's still a, a question that people ask. And that's, what's the difference between uh, wineries who put a cork in versus the screw top? Are we past the screw top? Are we okay with the screw top now? Because this wine, okay. this wine right here is a screw top. Are we going to be? No, it doesn't make any difference. It actually could be better. The wine 
could be better preserved with a screw top and you don't get the diseases that you get in corks. You know, there's a lot of diseases that you can get into a, a the one to be corked because the, the fungi or whatever it is, the bacteria will go into the cork of the wine and ruin it. And the screw cap not only will protect the wine and keep oxygen away from it because it's very effective in sealing the wine, but you also prevent diseases that you could get in the cork, get in the cork of the wine. And Australia and New Zealand have been doing this, making wine with screw caps since the 90s, since the 70s, the early 70s. And you know, and they're seeing now, because it's been almost 50 years, that it didn't affect the quality of the wine in a negative way at all. So when you open up a bottle for us, for a customer, yeah. out comes the cork, but then you take the cork and you present it to the customer. Yeah, I, I'm going to say this. I do not like that at all. I do not like presenting to the customer because why is the customer going to deal with it? Like you as a sommelier, you should smell the cork yourself to make sure the wine is not bad. And then you present the wine to the customer and place it in front of them or place it on a nice ice chiller, maybe. But why do you want to give the cork to the customer? Only if they collect it, maybe. I'm going to bring it home. This is going to be a souvenir, a memory for me. But it doesn't make any sense. Well, you, I didn't ask the question, but you answered it. I would go, when you put the cork in front of me, what am I supposed to do with it? <laughs> It's true. It's silly. But you know what? I had, we had a bad review once. It wasn't me as a sommelier. It was another sommelier before me. Um, and they complained that the sommelier, they gave one star less because the sommelier didn't give them the cork, uh, which is ridiculous. But some people want to have the cork. They think this is the proper proper way. You know, it's just it's just silly. But, you know, it's a lot of, like you said, a lot of snobbery. Uh, a lot of silly things that we are taught to do and that they don't make any sense, and please just don't. Um, okay, so I, w I wanted to go, I, you know what's funny, I went and grabbed, I grabbed the two bottles I thought that I needed, and I actually, because I like to hold up the bottles. Uh -huh. I, and I, what I did was I went and grabbed two, but they're the same type, I, I got two Borgongs out. So okay. I, I want to put one back, this is going to make for very boring internet, but I'm going to go, <laughs> go and, and change the bottle. That's okay. Well, I know that you also mentioned Bordeaux, or you have a nice wine cellar there. Cute little wine cellar. Thank you. <laughs> I know that you also mentioned Bordeaux about left bank and right bank, so I wasn't sure that if you had the Burgundy or you also had the Bordeaux, but if you had a Bordeaux there, that would be cool to see as well. Then we can kind of talk about the how Bordeaux is a different kind of species. He just left me alone here talking to my oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just going to drink since you're not. I'm just okay, well, I figured out what I'm going to do. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go shut the fridge that I didn't shut. <laughs> okay, so que the question, first question about the fridge, by the way, is, is yeah. when do I need to buy a wine fridge and what temperature do I keep it at? Because that's 52 yeah. degrees. That is good. <laughs> you can leave it 50, I would say. Okay. But you know what? Um, it's only when you are collecting wines that you need a wine fridge. Um, if you have a house that is temperature control, like it is, you know, in Canada, I bet, you know, they always have uh, the same kind of temperature inside. It's not going to be highs and lows and a lot of, uh, you know, alterations there in terms of temperatures. So it's going to be fine if you leave it anywhere in like, a darker place because you don't want to have a lot of light. Yes, this is what affects wine. It affects the temperature and the light is what affects wine. So if you keep in a darker, cool place, it's fine. But if you have a lot of wines, yeah, then definitely invest in a wine fridge. So people would make fun of me because I had a wine fridge, but everyone's like, what are you getting a wine fridge for? So you could go and like your, keep your $20 wines all... <laughs> Now there is knobs. <laughs> they are. Anyway, I was going to reach out. What I was going to do is I was going to open up a Bordeaux, um, but I did buy, and this is, here's a Bordeaux here. Um, this is a Shadow Pipo from 2010. Okay. Um, now, it was a very good year in Bordeaux, by the way. Yes. And, and uh, this one, by the way, is about 49 American dollars, maybe about 54 American dollars. That is nice. It's a Saint Million Grand Cru. Oh, it's one of my favorites here. Right, so I'm not opening this up right now. No, don't. Don't waste it. We are not doing this on the internet. The birth of your next child, maybe. 
Do you know how old I am? <laughs> I, I will not ask because I'm nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, uh, science is taking care of that, by the way. Um, anyhow, the uh, it was Bourgogne, so left bank, right bank. Yeah, that's in Bordeaux. They usually go with left bank, right bank. Yeah. So Bordeaux, this Saint Emilion is, is a left bank. Is that correct? Saint Emilion is right bank. Right. So I got that. <laughs> that is why you're here. <laughs> so right bank, uh, which is you know the Gihon and the home bank, bank. Sorry, right left bank is the division with the rivers that go into Bordeaux. Uh, so the right bank is mostly Merlot, and it also has Cabernet Franc, uh, and could have a little bit of the other noble grapes of Bordeaux, but it's mostly Merlot. And it uh, just means that it's a little softer than the left bank, which tends to be Cabernet Sauvignon dominated. Uh, also has Merlot and could also have Cabernet Franc, but it's mostly Cabernet Sauvignon on the left bank and mostly Merlot on the right bank. And I hate when people say they don't like Merlot because they say they don't like Merlot because they haven't tried Saint Emilion. Because Saint Emilion is a beautiful Merlot. It's a beautiful blend. Yeah, so it's interesting. So the California wine scene Napa, we know the grapes. There, the, you know, I mean, the great the marketing is all in the grapes, but then France, it's not. No, no. We, you know, there are people who dump all over Merlot, but then would take this bottle of wine that I had and think it's the great. Yeah, one. it's like they say, I hate Chardonnay, and they buy a Chablis. Chablis is Chardonnay. I mean, I hear that all the time. Um, you can trick people like that. They go like, oh, I don't like Chardonnay, and I would give them a Chablis, and they're like, Well, this is great. So. So, you know, it is just because they don't know the region. So France usually goes by region, doesn't go by grape. Like I say, when I see a Vouvray here, uh, you should know that Vouvray will be a Chenin Blanc if it's a white wine. And if you see a Sancerre from the Loire Valley as well, it's going to be Sauvignon Blanc. And a Bordeaux could be, you know, Milo, Cabernet Sauvignon, or mostly Cabernet Sauvignon, Milo, Cabernet Franc, Petit Verdot, etc. So, uh, it is usually based in the region, not based in the grapes. That's how they divide. That's mostly the old world. Um, Europe likes to do that. Rioja is also a region. Ribera do Duero is also a region. Chianti is a region. And so you know that Chianti is going to be the Sangiovese grape, you know, and the Barbaresco is going to be the Nebbiolo grape. But they don't tell you that. They just put you the, the region there and they assume that you're going to know what wine you are getting. So this is what European wine is a little bit harder to understand. Yeah. Um, so why do Europeans do so much better at taking collections of grapes, you know, mixing them up, coming out with their final product? And in California, we don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> and when I say when I say we, I mean us people here in the new world. Right. Yes, you're right. And I see that everywhere, even in South America, too. I see a lot of, uh, there's not many blends. I think that people from the new world, this is very generalization, of course, that's not true for everybody, but they still think that blends or assemblage are lesser quality wines. For some reason, they think that good wines are wines that are just made with one grape, and they are missing out because the best wines in the world, in my opinion, are made with a blend of grapes, like Chateau Neuf du Pape. Um, so if you're just thinking that you're just going to have Pinot Noir because I don't like a blend, you are just really <laughs> saying something very silly. And this is me being very nice because when somebody says, no, 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 I don't know. I don't want this. Uh, why? Oh, because it's a blend. It's just like they put it, they think that they just put it like the rest of this grape and then the rest of that grape. And that's not how they do. They just try to make a very interesting and structured wine by making together, getting together different grapes and putting a percentage of each grape, it's almost like chemistry. And this is gonna make the perfect wine. I'm gonna make 80% Merlot here, and then I'm gonna put 10% uh, of Cabernet Sauvignon, and the rest is gonna be a little bit of Cabernet Franc, which is they do in Champagne. People don't realize that, but Champagne is usually a blend of grapes. It's Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Pinot Meunier. So they usually make a lot more Chardonnay or Pinot Meunier, sorry, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, and a little bit of Pinot Meunier. And so of course it can be either way. If you want a creamy, easy wine, it'll be a Chardonnay. If you want a more, you know, interesting, deeper wine, it could be Pinot Noir, but it's always a blend of grapes. Almost always a blend so, of grapes. So uh, Chardonnay, by the way, also, th that perks me up a little bit. And I, I always say, hey, would you like a glass of Chardonnay? And I'm like, you have anything else? <laughs> and, and I know it's not a, it, I don't know how I got that way, but 
you know, it tastes a little bit oaky. It tastes a little bit. Because the California Chardonnays, California Chardonnays, they give a bad name to Chardonnay. And I'm sorry to say that because there are really good California Chardonnays, but there are some overly oaked Chardonnays that are just awful, awful from California. And that's people think, oh, this is all Chardonnays. But no, try Chardonnays from other places. You have Chardonnays from Chile. They're amazing. From Argentina, from Australia makes wonderful Chardonnays. You just have to get out of, you know, in Chablis, like I said, in France, uh, which is in Burgundy, they make amazing Chardonnays as well. I mean, Burgundy white is Chardonnay. And, uh, and they make amazing ones. So you have to get out of Napa and California. How should I be tasting wine? Because you're tasting wine right now. Mm -hmm. um, how does one taste wine? <laughs> what, 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 what am I looking for? Okay, if you want to do this in a professional way, uh, what we always say is first you look at the color. Um, the color would tell you, usually they would tell you how old the wine is. So white wine, it ages from very, um, it starts very pale like a, almost a real white wine, and then it goes deeper and deeper in color until it goes, gets to a very deep yellow, a golden uh, color. And red wine will start in a purple color in its infancy and then go to a ruby color, deeper red, and age into a brownish uh, tone towards the end. Because all wines, they have a cycle as well. Life, they will uh, start, and then they're going to be too young, and then they're going to have its peak, and then they're going to decline and die in a way. Um, so we just have to, the color would tell us which stage of their lives the wine is. And this one that I'm trying right now is quite young, it's like 2018. So it's got a little bit of yellow, but definitely not a deep yellow either. And so very easy to, to drink. And can you tell me a little bit about decanting the wine? Like when do I have to decant wine? When do I not need to do that? And what yeah. is what is decanting wine? So decanting wine, you have a decanter, of course, and decanter is just a, a vessel, a device made of glass that you will pour the wine from the bottle into this, into the decanter very slowly. Um, and two things that the decanter can do. First of all, you're going to get a lot of oxygen into the wine. And so you're going to have a lot more aromas, a lot more flavors. The wine is going to be easier and smoother. And the other thing that decanter can do, um, sometimes you want a light under the decanter to see it, is just you're going to pour slowly your wine into the decanter. And once you see sediment coming into the decanter, you stop because you don't want the sediment inside your wine that you're going to drink. And the sediment is accumulated because of the time, and that is usually for older wines. So you don't want sediment in it, so you decant it. So you can decant wines that are a little older, or you can decant wines that are very big, very bold, and you want the aromas to be a little bit smoother and less less strong, really. So, uh, good point. So, this one that I purchased today, mm -hmm. which is a Chateau Pipo from from 2010, again, like you mentioned, a very good year. Yeah. I was told decant it. Okay. The next thing they said was uh, keep it upright. There's going to be some sentiment uh, sediment in it. Yeah. So, is is that bad sediment? No, it's not bad at all. It's all natural. You can't drink sediment, but it's just not pleasant to drink sediment. You know, that's why people avoid it. You don't want a lot of, and it doesn't look good either on your glass. You know, when you are towards the end and you have a lot of like black things around your glass, it's just, people don't like that, but it's not, nothing bad. And also, sorry, talking about tasting, the other thing that you have to do is just smell the wine. And you, of course, you're going to swirl the wine around uh, and then just really stick your nose into that. When you are at a restaurant and they want you to try the wine, you don't even have to try the wine. You can just throw it around and just stick your nose into the glass and you see if the wine is off or not. So the nose tells you everything. If the wine is good or the wine is not good. Um, so, so a question that I forgot to ask earlier, but I'm here now. Sure. Uh, and do you think any less of me for this stemless wine glass? <laughs> um. No, I don't think that's of you, but I do not own any stemless wine glass. I understand that some people, you know what? I, I would say this. I've all, I was always a snob with stemless wine glasses. And then there was this older lady who was having an event in our restaurant and she couldn't hold the stem. And that's when I saw like, yes, that's that's the reason why people, a good reason to have a stemless uh, glass of wine. Um, 
I think that holding by the stem is better just because if you hold it here by the glass, the actual glass, you're going to have fingers smudging it and you also could change the temperature of the wine uh, slightly and that will change the wine just a bit. But, you know, it's nothing that important if you're having a, a nice, cheerful, easy wine. It's not going to make much difference in it. Okay, you're very, very diplomatic, Dora. Um, so, so what, what, what I see when I see stemless wine glasses and I see people drinking them, mm. it, it's the university or college equivalent of the red cup. <laughs> no, no, the red cup is worse. Come on. If you at least have in a glass, an actual glass, don't use plastic. No, 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 no. That's, that's, that I draw the line. I, I draw the line there. No, not in plastic. I hate tasting wine in plastic. That just alters the taste completely. Uh, actually, I had a friend who, you know, he loved his seven or eight dollar bottle of, of wine. In, in fact, I think it was called Fusion. I don't remember where it was from. Uh, it, it was it was South America, I think, where it came from. Mm. He loved it. Was, and by the way, it's a great wine. I used to serve it to people and people were like, oh, this is very good. And it's like eight bucks. And you're going to have one of those. And, uh, you know, those are your unicorns. If you find the unicorn, bring it in. We want to know. We want to meet yeah. the unicorn. Yeah. But he would serve it in in a in a in a regular cup you know that you would a glass that you would serve orange juice and he you know that's the way he had his dinner and you didn't need to use the nice wine glasses for it and i i think that's perfectly fine um yeah, sure. but, well, i won't judge <laughs> i did open the bottle part of the experience though you know like putting wine in a wine glass it's that thing that's part of the experience of having a wine so i just like having a wine glass it just for me it's everything enhances the flavor of the wine, the experience of having the wine. So I like having a wine glass. So that could be psychological, really. I was going to open the uh, Bordeaux, but I wound up opening up the the, the Bourgogne here, uh, sure. which is a Pinot Noir. Uh huh. Um, so I'll put that. But he, here it is. It's it's now into the into the wine glass. So run. You kind of touched on a little bit, but run run it through one more time, because this is this is in the glass, but it's going to get better. And I've got a nice wide red. Yeah, yeah, really good. Like that's the proper red wine glass. That's yeah. Good. Yeah, you got to have a wide, wide uh, glass there because you have a lot more aromas and complexity and alcohol in the red wine. So in tannins. So the red, red wine, even though I don't have a preference between white and red, I think red wines, because of the aging, you know, can the possibilities of the winemaker. And you know types of oak as well. Uh, it can be a lot more interesting, a lot more structured, and a lot more complex than white wine. So you want a big glass to taste all the aromas and different little flavors and, and nuances of the red wine for sure. I don't need that because I have a white wine, so I don't have a very very large glass at all. Yeah, you know I don't want to pass judgment. I never want to pass judgment on a red mm -hmm. on glass number one i always find it's glass number two where you know when we're having a meal that is where i make my decision about whether this is good or bad <laughs> because you're letting the oxygen do its job over there yeah exactly it opens up very nicely yeah not every wine will benefit by the way there are some wines that you don't have to leave it in the glass as well i, I mean that one that i was i was taking up i took a picture of instagram and had the gold wire it was a 10 year old it was a grand reserve 2007 it's been aged in uh, oak barrels for about 18 months and then it was aged in bottle in the bottle for over 10 years and then released to the market and it was so smooth when once you open it you did not need to let air at all it was just so perfect because it's been aged for so long in a bottle and not in an oak, an oak uh, barrel that it was already so smooth and I thought it was perfect. So I didn't think that I needed two hours there. And some wines, if they're very, very old, if you leave it for a long time, they can be ruined with the oxygen too. So you got to be careful about, you know, letting air for a long time. So I was super surprised today when I went to the store and found this, this 2010, mm -hmm. you know, right bank wine. And I've known it's a good year and that they were selling it. And I'm trying to think to myself, at what point does it, you know, okay, drink it now. You know, there's, this needs to be dr consumed now because in five years, it's not going to work. Like, how do we know that stuff? Oh, it's so many factors. First of all, it's the year, if it was a good year or not. 2010 was a perfect year, what they call a 10. Uh, but, you know, if you were with a 
2011, which wasn't as good, um, you wouldn't be able to age it that well. So it really depends on the year got enough, you know, sunshine or enough rain, yeah, just uh, no diseases, no fires, whatever it is. Um, you just have to know the year if it was good and the propensity of the likability of the wine to age. Uh, the tannins need to be strong. The tannin is what you have in the skin of the grapes, more so in red wines, and they help the wine age. Um, so it really is a guessing game too. If you are going to open a wine, sometimes they are wonderful, and sometimes you think, well, actually, it could have aged that for long, longer, for a little bit longer. 2010 should be good now, and 2020 because it's already been 10 years. But I also think that it could age a little longer. So a lot of people, they go out to a restaurant, you know, this is their big night out. They're getting a wine. Somalia comes by and is going to open it up and, and pour a little bit to try. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, you know, and I have sent one or two bottles back in my lifetime, but <laughs> how do I know when to really send it back? Oh, well, it's, you know what? This is what I think. Uh, if you're being very adventurous and you decided on a grape you've never heard before or a country never heard before, and there's nothing wrong with the wine when you smell it, it's not completely disgusting on the taste, um, do send it back because it was your choice to be adventurous about the wine. But if you think that the wine's smelling off and you can tell, I think that everybody can tell if the wine is, has an unpleasant, moldy, you know, disgusting scent or the taste is a little bit off to acidic, just all over the place, then this wine is corked and you should send it back 100%. So there are two things. I don't like when people send it back. It never happens, by the way. Almost never happens for them to send it back when it's not off. But it's happened that somebody would be, I was doing wine tasting and I was so busy opening wines that I didn't smell them because I usually don't even taste them. I just smell them and go for it. Um, but so I didn't taste this one when I opened the glass. And so I poured it and the guy just said, you know what? I think this wine is off. And he was absolutely right. It was off. And I just had to say sorry and open a new bottle. So if, if the customer says this is off, what do you do? Do you sniff it or what do you do? Yeah, I will take the bottle away. I will never contest. I will never say, no, it's not off. You know, if somebody says it's off, even if they're wrong and you know they're wrong, don't just try to argue with the customer. I mean, just don't embarrass them that way. They're here for a nice time. They don't want to hear that. Um, sometimes I um, I just take the wine away. <laughs> we will drink it together and stuff. And uh, I'll give them another choice. I will not correct them. Um, and when I think the wine is actually off, I say, yeah, I'm so sorry. You're absolutely right. The wine was, was corked. I'll be happy to get you another bottle. And I mean, listen, the staff is never going to complain about getting a good bottle to drink after work. Yeah. They're very, very happy. They love it when it happens. It doesn't happen often, but they love it when it happens. <laughs> so I've got some, re I've got some go-tos when it comes to, to, to cooking. Right. And, and there are just, I'm just stuck in my ways. You'll never get me off this. So if I'm cooking a tomato sauce, we're having bruschetta or we're having, you know, yeah, some, you know, I'm going for a Chianti. Right. That's perfect. Right. And so we had, you know, we had outdoor, we went for some wood fired or pizza this summer and I brought Chianti mm. to the party and everybody thought I was a superstar and really smart. You know what they thought? They thought I was the Dora Lobo of Manitoba. That is. Wow. It's nice to know that I'm so known in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> but there are some things that just work and yeah it, so, so aside from you know the Chianti and tomato sauce what else is out there that that is just a slam dunk every time never fails <laughs> what you just said is just the other principle of wine pairing which is um pairing the grape or the wine from the country with the dish of the country so if you're having something like bruschetta like you just said um, you should pair with Italian wine and Chianti uh, being a medium bodied wine, which is not going to overpower the bruschetta and has good acidity too. It's perfect pairing. So trying to pair wines from the same region or country, even if you're going to go with the same, you know, the same cheeses from the, from the country, you got to pair a Spanish red with a Manchego, then great. You know, a uh, Sancerre with uh, a Brie, it's, perfect because it's from the same place and so that's why you have to to think about as well about pairing um that 
So, you know, in a cab, when you, there are things that are non, no nonsense, which is like a cab with, with beef that everybody loves. It's it's really easy pairing, I would say. Um, Sauvignon Blanc is great with fish as well. It's just some grapes that are just really easy to, to go with certain um, dishes. There's a few uh, places I'll pop into that sell natural wine or organic wine. Yeah, okay. I know the next day I'm going to have a headache. <laughs> No. <laughs> right, right. That, 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 I mean, that's a little bit over the top, but um, I'm I'm leery about what what am I getting that's different from all the other wines out there. Yeah, I mean, I'm all for organic wine. I don't only drink organic wine. I know some people that tell me that they only drink organic wine, but I would say the organic is never bad because you know that you are not having all the chemicals that go into a glass of wine. Um, it's definitely a cleaner wine, but natural wine is more divisive because natural wine, you have no filtration, no fining. And at the end of the winemaking process, the winemaker is going to filter the wine. So it doesn't look cloudy. It doesn't, you know, they correct some imbalance in the wine. Sometimes they use animal products too. So if you're vegan, that could be a problem because they might use egg whites to clarify the wines, you know, fish bladders sometimes, uh, gelatin. And so these are filtering agents that will help the wine in its taste. It will taste better, uh, correct some sort of imbalance in the taste, or it will correct the imbalance in the color so it's going to look better and not look all cloudy and, and disgusting. Uh, so natural wine, they don't do that. So they just just leave the wine as it is. And so it's going to be a very rough wine. It could be wonderful and it could be disgusting. So it's very much, you know, it's your – take your chance if you want to – drink a natural wine, but sometimes it's a really good surprise. I had a natural wine in Italy last year and that was the best, best thing ever. So tell me about some of the touring that you've done. Cause I was kind of going to go in this direction with a short snappers kind of thing with, with questions, but you mentioned you went to Italy. Tell yeah. me about your trip to Italy and where did you visit? Um, to tell the truth, I lived in Europe for a long time, so it was just easy, you know, got into an easy jet flight and just go to Spain and, and Italy and France. And the best uh, place that I've been to that I thought was more interesting was definitely Champagne in France. So the region of Champagne, Champagne is just so beautiful and there's so much, much history and it's luxurious in a way. And those calves, you know, those, those places that you go on the ground to see the champagnes and the, those bottles from, I don't know, from a hundred years ago or more. It's just so interesting. And I think that I recommend to everybody, even if you don't have, even the winery next to you, close to you, just, just go and, and look at it because you learn so much about wines by going to a winery or a vineyard and i hear i mean washington dc so <laughs> the good wines are not very close to me uh there are some good wines in upstate new york which i think they make some really nice wines in the finger lakes in new york and uh i think that the wines closer to me which are in virginia not great uh i'm so sorry to say that i'm not a big fan at all but if i can go you know anywhere that I can travel and taste wine there. That's the best place to be uh, and taste wine where it's actually from. So the locals can teach you about the history of the wine and all the details about it. Well, I was going to send you up to Long Island. That's probably. <laughs> they make wine in Long Island. I know. That, that, that's <laughs> <It's beautiful. laughs> But I, I, you know, it, it, I think when it comes to wine, it, it just takes time for the region to really, you know, perk up. You know, you've got to. Yeah, it was never meant to be. <laughs> well, it's very possible. Um, yeah. So I'll give you an example. So where I, I went to school up in the Annapolis Valley of Nova Scotia, we, we didn't really talk about wine back in, in, in late 80s, early 90s. But now there's a region, there's a scene, there are wine tours. There's some of the most, you know. Why is the wine there? The wine, it's coming. <laughs> it's, okay. Okay. <laughs> Hey, you know, listen, I had a, it was a good bottle. Uh, so I'm thinking specifically Wolfville, Nova Scotia. And so there's a town called Grand Prix, which is right beside it. But the wine has sort of perked up in the last 20 years. And here it comes. Right. It's, it's wonderful farmland, always has been. And I think it takes time for a region to, you know, to figure it out, to, you know, to have a number of go throughs and, you know, some, you know, wine from Arizona. I never really thought about that, but now it's a thing. And, are you laughing? Yes, no? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I think there's some regions, though. I mean, in Virginia, they've been making wine for a long time, right? Thomas yeah. Jefferson have 
vineyards there, but it just I just can't get through it. I just don't think that the climate yeah makes interesting wines. And you know, there you might find some Viognier that's interesting there, but majority of the wines that I try there, it's just harder. It's just harder. And I love, you know, I love my favorite regions in America is it's just definitely Oregon. They make wonderful Pinot Noir and Washington State, more than California. Um, but from Canada, I just know ice wine, to tell you the truth, because that's what people talk about. Canada is just ice wine. Are you, are you, well, first of all, tell me about ice wine. Are you, why are you a buyer of it? Ice wine is just, you know, wine that you pick um, in the dead of winter and cold, in the cold, cold night of Canadian winters. And the grapes are frozen and the sugar is concentrated in the grapes. And so you pick when it's frozen and then sugar is, is basically in there and you're going to make a much, much sweeter wine. So it just makes a super, super sweet wine. That's what ice wine is. And yeah, you got to have the palate to do it and the right food to, to have it. It's really good wine, by the way. It's right up there with the best dessert wines in the world, but it's definitely sweet. Very yeah. sweet. From, from the Niagara region. And I'm, I'm glad we're talking about Canada because I want to give uh Quail's Gate is, is my go-to. My Quail's Gate Pinot Noir is probably one of my favorite Canadian wines. Retails 30 bucks Canadian, 20 some odd dollars American. Mm -hmm. I enjoy it. But the ice wine thing, I go back to the restaurant where I had already, you know, knocked off a bottle of Shiraz at the Indian restaurant and out would come ice wine for dessert, you know, and, the dessert, and I'm like, you got this free from the winery. I don't want this. <laughs> it can be too sweet, but you just have to have, for example, you can pair ice wine with blue cheeses, which is really interesting. Instead of just pairing with dessert, which is just sweet and sweet, you can pair with something a little bit on the bitter side, and it just makes sense with ice wine. People also say that foie gras, I'm all against foie gras, by the way, <laughs> vegetarian, but people say that foie gras is great with uh, ice wine as well. So it really depends on what you are having. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about the vegetarian aspect, because I'm always looking for the cab stove, always matches with the red meat. And tomorrow night, I'm going to have more red meat. So now I'm going to pull out my French wine, which is going to marry with the red meat. Yeah, it would be great. Right. You know what? I still drink all kinds of wine, even though I turn vegetarian. Um, I still drink, drink everything that I wanted to drink. So I just make, you know, yesterday I made a Brazilian dish, but I made a vegan version of a Brazilian dish. It's called feijoada, which is just like a casserole with beans and peppers and things. But instead of putting pork, which is usually in the dish, I just put the vegan sausage inside. And so I had a really nice uh, big wrap with it. So that was great for me. You know, I just do not stop drinking what I want to drink. I just make up my own uh, recipes just to adapt to, you know, nowadays you have so many meat alternatives and, you know, you have the flavor of beef or chicken or turkey, et cetera. And you can pair it very well with, with the reds that would go normally with beef, chicken, et cetera. So I'm not missing anything. I'm not missing anything. I promise. No. So when you say you're vegetarian, does it mean you're 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 vegan or? No, I'm vegetarian. I still I would still enjoy a Ben and Jerry's ice cream and a pizza with real cheese from time to time. So I can I can say I'm vegan. I do avoid it, but I still I would not say no to a very delicious uh, margarita pizza, a bruschetta, like you said too. Why do wine? Why does wine and cheese pair so well? I know it's crazy right this is the problem with me and i can get rid of cheese because cheese is just so complements wine so perfectly i can't explain why it does but i just think that it's they, they are just perfect pair for one another when you put some nuts there some jam there it just makes the whole very very interesting thing you know as a snack as a conversation piece i just just think that cheese is wonderful and there's a whole art behind the cheese as well which i really respect people who make cheese you know it's just to make those flavors more pronounced nutty and floral it's just almost like wine so i think it's really interesting too so i said i would keep you here for an hour and and this is uh, probably the first of five or six lives in a row I, i'm going to tell you uh, <laughs> I, I do have more questions all right, um, that's perfect. We so as, long, as long as you have time. Uh, first of all, what are you having for dinner tonight? I think that I'm going to make, so my husband wants a uh, mukeka, which is another Brazilian dish, which is like a seafood casserole. Um, and I make it and I take away the fish for me, but it's still delicious because it's got coconut milk, tomato, 
etc. I gotta say, I haven't tried, I haven't chosen the wine yet, which I should do, but I'll probably uh, go with a lighter red. I might go with a rose actually. I have a rose here, which is called Saint Poussin, which is also from France, of course, and it's delicious. So, has he ever sent a wine back? For well, my husband? Yeah. No, he just, doesn't yeah. know anything about wine. No way. He doesn't even taste it. He just gives it to me to taste. I choose. I taste. I'm just it's thinking good. that would be a bad relationship move. <laughs> I would be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> uh, no. So a complete disservice to everybody who is listening on the podcast. But it, for those who are watching on video, the, the red that I opened, when I smelt it the first time, didn't smell very good. Now it smells much better. So we've. Yeah, over about 20 minutes since it sat here. It's much, much better. It's a burgundy, right? What year is that burgundy? Um, is it a problem if it's not listed? That would be a big problem. It has to be listed. It's in the law. It might be in the on top in the top here. You see why you were holding when you put in your thumb? Yeah, uh, 2017. 2017, yeah, it's a young one. So yeah, it does benefit from from a little bit of oxygen there. That's why. Yeah, and have you ever felt, have you ever found a defective wine that was completely not labeled right? And you're like, no, nah, it can't be. Well, if they do that in the, well now, you know, it's, it's the European Union regulates most of it. So it has to have the wine, the vintage of the wine, the year that the grapes were harvest, or otherwise, you know, it's probably counterfeit. <laughs> it just could be a fake bottle of wine. <laughs> So you've done some traveling and you would travel, I guess, from London to some of these European countries and you would yeah. go and touch on a tour. I'll, I'll mention the country. You tell me, give me the best experience from a winery that you had when you were there. Maybe it, it's a memory or uh, your best day. So, I'll, for example, I went to California, went up to Napa and I couldn't get past cake bread, the cake bread winery. Mm. I, when I got in there and, and tasted a few, I loved um, what cake bread offered on the white side. I just, you know, that's where I said, okay, this Californian white retails, you know, 40, 50 bucks. It's delicious. I found some, some other ones as well. The Chardonnay is a little bit more expensive, but I, I was a buyer in that, you know, at that point, I'm like, yeah. it's old. No, cake bread makes good wine. I gotta say, I hate the name of the winery cake bread, but I love, I love the wines for sure. So I'll send you to, so you, you mentioned you've gone, you went to Italy. So tell me about your Best day in Italy, touring a winery. Best Italian, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'm gonna say like the best winery, but I would say that I went to Tuscany and that was all paid for by the company that worked in London. And that was the best experience because they put us in castles everywhere in, in Italy. And so these Italian producers who've been making wine since medieval times, they are putting us up in these castles so we could sleep there and try the best kind of cuisine imaginable. And back then I was still eating fish. So I was just eating this wonderful six, seven course meals with the best wine. And it was just amazing. I will never forget. That was definitely Tuscany is on one of the best, the most beautiful places I've ever seen in my life. So if you're thinking about doing a wine trip, I would say Tuscany is the way to go. You're gonna be blown away. The food is also amazing. So I did a trip there in 2016. I will echo all that. Um... <laughs> Perfect. Went to, went to the town of Chianti, um, Multicino. I just, it's so good. Yeah, it's amazing. And I went not only in Tuscany, but I also went to Umbria and all those places around over there in Europe. I went to Pisa and um, Firenze, and I just thought that was the best trip of my life. I'll never forget it. I just, good wine, good food, good weather, good people. It was just beautiful and definitely it will be top that my top uh wine trip of my life let me move you over to france you mentioned that you fell in love with uh, some of the whites from loire valley so yeah. but tell me a little bit about something in france a, a great day you had in france and, and something that's wine related um yeah i went to the loire valley and i was bitterly disappointed when I went to the Loire Valley because I thought it was so boring there. <laughs> I gotta say, but the best one, like I said, was definitely the trip to Champagne because I just thought it was so amazing, those places, those calves, like Krug, um, uh, was it Pomehi, Champagne Pomehi was just 
beautiful places. There's so much history and they're so gorgeous, these places. And they're just very welcoming too. And when you have a champagne taste of, you know, years that you never think that you would be able to try and they're not available uh, here in America or weren't even available in London back then, I thought I was the luckiest person ever. And when you say that you are you work with wine, they always treat you differently too. So it's it's always great. And a country that I love, um, I find the wine, of course, a little bit complex. That's why I had to ask you. But but what happened when you went to Spain? Where did you go, and and what'd you find? Oh, I gotta say, I never been to a wine. I never been to a wine region in Spain, which is I'm so bummed about it. But I've been to Spain. I've been to Madrid. I've been to Barcelona. I've been to a few places, but I never been to Rioja. It's really upsetting because I actually prefer Ribera do Duero in terms of wines. I think they make even better wines than Rioja. Uh, they tend to be a little bit more expensive. Uh, the wines are really outstanding in terms of flavor so but i never never been i'm afraid i have never been to ribera do duero okay so tell me about that region where is it it's in and it's a little bit north up from rioja and just makes a lot of assemblages or blends uh that tends to be very robust and big and just aged in barrels for a longer time and also Tempranillo is one of the grapes that we will find there. Um, so I think Ribera del Duero is just a, just a wonderful, interesting wine region. And I just think that even though they're robust wines, they also tend to be very smooth and very easy to drink. So I'm com I'm not completely lost on, on, on where this is. So I'm, I'm going to have to, this is where I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go to the map. Uh. <laughs> it's okay. You can go to the map. All right. Well, it's a geo, so it's like a denominación de or, origen. Um, and my Spanish, even though I'm a Portuguese speaker, uh, my Spanish is not wonderful. Um, but yeah, Ribera do Duero is in, it's one of those those places that you really find wines that you never thought you would. Because you meant you mentioned it was north, but north of Rioja, correct? Um, yeah, it's. I'm not very good with that, but it's like you have Madrid, and you go up, up, up. And it's like straight, you know, when you go to Madrid, just look for Madrid in the map and just go straight up. So it's north, but like before um, before the, the coast, not in the coast, you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. And uh, you go like Bilbao to the north. Yeah, I see it. Right. It's right between Bilbao and Madrid. I'm not really that good with geography in Spain, but it is more towards the north. Okay, so what, what's it called again? Uh, Ribera. It's uh, R I B E. All right. Ribera. And then Del, D E L. And then where is D U E R O? Okay, so uh, right here, I'm circling this, by the way. Um, it, Legrono, you can see on the map right now. Legrono, I spent three days in Legrono. And, oh, okay. So, and, and by the way, so if, if you are looking for a trip to Spain, and you want to go to some of the best places for wine, mm -hmm. park yourself in Legrono, and the big debate does come up, uh, Rioja or Ribera. So which one? I prefer Ribera. I gotta say, I prefer Ribera. Just try it. And let yeah. me know later. Just try Ribera the Twitter and tell me. Because Rioja is, like I said, there are a lot of bad Riojas. There are a lot of bad apples in Rioja. <laughs> and, yeah. and I stay away from Rioja Crianza because it just means, Crianza means child, right? So it's a wine that hasn't been aged, hasn't been developed. It's just a wine in its infancy. It's not interesting enough. But then you go to Ribera do Duero, usually wines are much smoother, much interesting. I just think that Ribera, which is north, it's just pretty beautiful. Yeah, as a friend of mine said, uh, some of the Riojas can taste like cooked fruit. Yes, they can yeah. be super jammy and alcoholic and not smooth enough, whereas Ribera usually makes. And what's interesting is that Rioja has kind of a higher classification in terms of it's a DOC, which is Denominación de Origen Controlata. Uh, and then you got Ribera, which is a DO, which is Denominación de Origen, which could be a lower classification, but it's actually a much better one. So sometimes it doesn't mean much. So in that time that you, you said you were in Madrid. Um, yeah, I went to Madrid. Yeah. And so tell me, uh, by the way, why I'm a big buyer of, of going to Spain. I, I've been to Italy. Okay. I, like, I like France, but I'm always in Spain because there's wine, but there's also food. And the food culture in Spain is, is second to none. Yeah. Um, 
you know, especially if you're in Madrid, yeah. uh, you know, there's there's a bar culture and tapas and yeah, it's beautiful. You know, I have a friend. She I met her in England, and she just told me she moved to Madrid, and I cannot wait to visit her. I'm so excited that she's moving to Madrid. I don't have to go to London, you know, which the weather is usually not that great, but Madrid is just wonderful. And you're right, the food in Madrid is just delicious. If you eat fish as well and you go to Barcelona, also amazing. You know, they have great fish in Madrid. They they ship it in every day and they have since, uh, you know, since Ferdinand and Isabel <laughs> way back when. <laughs> Yeah, they do have, you know, everywhere in Spain, they have wonderful, wonderful food. Yeah. Um, so you being from Brazil, I will assume that you know some, some Portuguese, obviously, and some... That's my first language, yes. And so, and you've got a grasp of Spanish as well? Yeah. Anything else? I uh, in very briefly, too. Um, but my French is not great. You know what? The first time I learned French was when I was an exchange student in the USA, when I was... A teenager and I learned with a Canadian lady I just remember that <laughs> she taught me French so I assume you you speak French as well yeah I speak French there you go man. so I'm not gonna embarrass myself speaking French with you okay because your French is probably <laughs> much better than mine uh, actually I mean I would love to learn a little bit more Spanish so just <laughs> so I can get by with uh, you know ordering in, in Spain and you know, you can learn to order in Spain. I mean, I think the first thing you learn when you order in Spain is is that you're not, you know, is, is how to order, you know, not by the grape, but by the region. You have to learn that sort of language, you know, and you could travel from Legrono up to the Basque country and then you're ordering completely different drinks. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I think Spain is a country that's it's great to explore. It's one of the best for wines and food and uh, it's one of them. definitely my love i always say that if i were to retire anywhere it would be either in spain in madrid or in portugal that would be my top two choices there um why are we why do why are most of people wanting to go to those places to retire because yeah, it's a lot of English people retire there because it's sunny, it's nice, and it's cheaper than going to other places in Europe. So that's why. Yeah, people in, in England all want to go down to Malaga to get... Of course, they want to, you know, the English weather is just the worst. Of course, they want to go to Malaga. They want to have an easy life that they enjoy in English weather for all their lives. They're like, please, I suffered enough. I want to go to Spain or Portugal. <laughs> yeah, I want to go to Spain, too. I just don't want to run into the English. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> you know, it reminds me of the day. I, I promise we, we took the train from uh, Bilbao to uh, Barcelona. And I said, we're going to have, I promise you, we'll go to uh, the plaza. Um, and I will get you paella and we'll have a nice lunch. Mm. And we got there and it was the day of the Barcelona-Manchester United game. And the place was oh. overrun with Man U fans. <laughs> They are the worst. <laughs> oh crap! The British are here. <laughs> yeah, many fans they don't have a good reputation, and I say that because I used to date a guy back in England who was a menu fan. And geez, <laughs> geez, Louise, I will say nothing, nothing else. <laughs> How did you get to the United States? My husband, he's American. Um, so yeah, and we moved to here to Washington DC. We were in Alexandria, Virginia, which is very close in Northern Virginia here. And uh, I actually live in Maryland. Everything's so small here that um, the suburbs of DC is Maryland where I live. And I commute to DC every day because that's where I work. So I have another podcast, it's about radio. And um, I didn't know that the area was called the DMV. Yeah, it is a DMV because it's so tiny. So it's, yeah, to see Maryland and Virginia is almost like one state. Yeah. And so the radio, uh, the person I was interviewing was was Sunny uh, from a WGPC radio station. And she, and I'm going to dovetail, watch how I dovetail this. Mm. Um, she grew up in, in Bosnia and wow. didn't know English until she was 15. She moved to Detroit and now she's on the radio in, in the DMV. Um, right. And you mentioned Serbia, by the way, a little bit earlier on as being a place where you could have wine that would pair very well. What are some of the other places? And 
I'll throw out a couple. What are some of the other places that we just go, we don't pay attention to those wines? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned Serbia, but I've also got Lebanon and Greece as well as places that I can get a really good wine. I don't know. I think that I have a lot of Greek wines now, in the, my my menu, wine menu. But then you have places like Republic of Georgia, which I think is really cool, which is kind of like where the birth of wine really was. You know, they found these vessels buried in the ground about 5,000 years ago. And this was in the Republic of Georgia in Eastern Europe. Um, and they make amazing wine and make really good orange wine as well. So that's one of the countries that I think that are really cool. And then you got Slovenia that makes also really great wine. And these are just, um, I and mean, then you got England, which I actually worked in an English winery, which makes really great sparkling wine and the same latitude as Champagne, France. So they make very wines that are very much like Champagne sparkling wines uh in brazil where i'm from they make wines as well and you never know but they make some good wines too so you gotta just try and experiment with countries sometimes it's gonna be hit or miss but you gotta you know try wines and diversify your palate and your taste and see what you like and what you don't i've never had a brazilian wine and i wasn't going to mention it but you did mention it so. <laughs> yeah uh, but brazilian wines are pretty great argentina chile i yeah. mean i know I know those ones. I mean, the Brazilian wines that I, I'm saying they're great, they're usually closer to Argentina. Um, and that's why you have like kind of the same soil, similar soil. It's in the south of Brazil. Um, but Argentina makes amazing wines as well, for sure. And Chile is one of my favorites. One of the best also wine visits of, of my trips of my life was in Chile. Uh, they're amazing because you have the mountains and you have, you know, the 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 sea close to you and you have you know the Pacific Ocean and you got everything is so close and you're able to see the nature and the city and the wineries are just there and it's just a really interesting place and it's so clean and so beautiful. Be so impressed when you go to Chile because people have the wrong idea about South America. They think, oh my God, it's so dangerous and it's dirty and weird and violent and but no Chile is just like you be there and you they treat you so well. People are so nice and it's so clean and so beautiful. It's just a really nice country to be in. And here's one that came across the other day that somebody told me orange wine has no orange in it. No, there's no orange. In it. Please don't say that. I've heard people asking me that plenty of times. Uh, why is it orange wines is made of orange? No, it's made of grapes. It's made of white grapes, actually, but they have the orange color to it, and that's why you call orange wines. It's basically made like red wine, so they ferment the skin of the grape, so you get the orange tint at the end of the winemaking process. That's why it's called orange wine, but it's got a lot more body than a normal white wine, and that's why it's so interesting. All right. Uh, Dora, where can uh, anybody who has actually made it to the end of this podcast? <laughs> it's so, such a long one. Oh, my God. Well, Maybe, maybe maybe they fell asleep. And, uh, Unless they're drinking. <laughs> this <might be> <laughs> um, where can we come into contact with, with anything that you do and what you do and um, Instagram? Where else? Yeah, I think if you go to Instagram, my website is there on Instagram as well. It's just storalobo.me. Uh, and, you know, I just I think these are the best places to find me. You can always direct message on Instagram and I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions that you have about wine. That's good because, uh, I, I, I mean, I've got an entire 90 minute show all ready to go for the next time we speak. And that's how to make an old fashioned and a Manhattan. I don't think it's going to take that long. <laughs> we can do that. <laughs> I did. I just strung a, a, an hour and 25 minutes, by the way, out of, um, out of talking about wine. We'll find a way to get through. really diverse and beautiful and big subject to dive into okay. Dora, thank you so much for, for taking the time um remind me what remind me one more time what you're having for dinner tonight i'm having mukaka which is a brazilian dish made with coconut milk um peppers and onions and you can put fish in it too it's like a fish stew and have you decided what you are going to pair with it i think i'm going to go with simple song which is uh, rosé wine, also from the Loire Valley, because so, I'm obsessed with the Loire Valley. I think I'm going to go for that one. Dora, thanks so much for taking the time to be on the podcast, and uh, we hope to see you again soon. 
It was really fun. Thank you so much for having me and have a nice week. Okay. Bye-bye.